realize that we have such an amazing um, and vibrant culture here in New Zealand. Maori has this unique culture, and in the highlands of Peru, they have, again, this um, vibrant cultural system. And for me, it was the starting point to think, yes, indigenous people share many commonalities. The worldviews are embedded in how, in how they're, they're, they guide their philosophy of a good life, you know, they guide their ways of knowing and being. So I knew there was these two commonalities with the Quechua people, the Maori people, and I would say how they produce their foods. And I also have been aware of the, for such a long time, indigenous people have been concerned about the way how food has been produced and the social impacts, socio-political impacts, environmental impacts of food, of the food systems. For instance, malnutrition in the highlands of Peru, where we have biodiversity. We are suffering of obesity, especially Maori kids and Pacific Island kids are suffering of obesity, diabetes. So how can that be possible? This country, which has a rich biodiversity in the highlands of Peru, and we have here at Teruoa, which have this vibrant culture, technologies, a developed nation, how come we're facing food, uh, food insecurity? So my work, I decided to take the, the extra step to investigate the food security frameworks of Quechua people and Maori people with the main aim to highlight the knowledge contribution in modern societies. I, I, through the studies of the literature, most of the literature talks about food security. And of course, they talk about food security with a Western head. And I feel so honored and privileged to be here and be talking just soon after Jessica, who, is, who I admire and admire her work. And I've been working with Percy T. Penny over the past few years. So I, I feel that very honored for that. Most of it talks about the best approach to produce food and to cope with the food challenges. It's the modern Western approach to food security based on availability, based on trying to provide, produce food without having into account the cultural values embedded in how you produce food. Of course, food security is kind of the modern approach to food security is an expression of capitalism, neoliberalism. Capitalism has its own ideology. It's tied up with profit making. The main goal is to maximize profits and how they do it. So they try to produce mass production, cheap food in order to feed the world. But that's not the right way. That's not the way how our ancestors managed to secure food. And I wanted to highlight that with my studies. I wanted to have an evidence-based research that provide a platform, will give us voices, will be able to tell our stories say how our ancestors produce food, how we want our health system to work, how we want the, the next generation to live. And in resonance with my background, I couldn't just say, okay, this is the research that I need. I'm gonna put forward this research. I had to go and talk to my own people, and I also had to here talk to Maori communities to know, to just make sure that my research resonates with the needs with the research needs and requirements to be able to have this nice um, research project. So in 2011 and 12, I embarked on this um, preliminary research. I traveled um, from Auckland to Cusco, then I went to um, the highlands of Peru, then I moved to the Amazons, where I was working with the Aguajun communities who are also facing malnutrition and food insecurity. I was working with the Quechua communities, and the issue of food insecurity came strongly. They definitely wanted someone, and there is no Westerner. Although I've been raised in a Western society, my worldviews, it comes from an indigenous philosophy. And I think they felt more comfortable telling the stories to someone that will honor their voices, the voices of their ancestors. Similarly, I did the same here in Aotearoa. I traveled 
to the North Island. I had a great time working in the Native Peru on Tufari Toa. I went up north and I had the honor to meet Perseti Pene or working with um, Papa Tunuku Marai on the Rahi Marai. So again, the issue of food insecurity resonated with the research requirements. Why? Because I wanted to have a research that will give voice and also will be able to act as a tool to move forward colonial approaches to food and production. Now I would like to tell you about this good life philosophy of the Quechua people of Peru. They have this ayin cause concept, which means the good life. Ayin means the good life, magnificent. Sumac is the same as ayin. However, my research, most of the good life philosophies and most of the writings are about summa causa that come from the Bolivian Quechua and the Ecuadorian Quechua, but because my work has been done in Peru, we address it and we call it ayin causa. In a nutshell, it is living in harmony with the cosmos, with nature, with all our relatives. And it's the same philosophy, the same worldviews as we have here in New Zealand. Although not as established as the Ayan Causa in Peru, in my research, the concept of Maori order resonated to some extent with the Ayan Causa. As we know from Maori people, Maori here, Maori is the spiritual essence, a life force, um, vibrant essence, as Jessica mentioned, aura, energy, spiritual, and physical element. A scholar uh, Morgan explained to me about Maori aura, it's the binding force between the physical and the spiritual. Also, because it is an indigenous based research, I had a challenging time to try to go to the field with my Western head and trying to implement the research tools, Western research tools. So I, had, I said, no, I can't just go and interview them. I need to build up reciprocal relationships. I need to go and talk to them, um, know, um, you know, spirituality is important. And because the Western approach to research is so different to the indigenous paradigm where the spiritual, where the relationship approach um, is embedded in um, our worldviews, I decided to develop an innovative research framework which I call the Kipu model. Um, for the ones that don't know much, much about the Kipu, the Kipu are, I don't know if I can highlight it, but they are the um, that the colorful environment courts. So the courts will be telling the, his, the stories of the ancestors. And it's, I'm drawing from the Kopapa Maori research, it's a Maori research framework from the potato park. And also I'm drawing from the traditional ecological knowledge theory that validates indigenous knowledge. All that is to tell the story from an indigenous um, um, perspective. We have the three main threads of knowledge. I'm grounding my philosophical position on, a, on an indigenous worldviews. It is indigenous-based research approach. And for me, the key pool model is a knowledge production and knowledge sovereignty indigenous research framework. Because I'm giving, I gave autonomy to the community. We work together to select, and they guided me to choose the best research um, tool for my research. For instance, from a Western perspective, focus groups is different from an indigenous perspectives. And for us, it's talking circles. Why talking circles? Because we embrace the spiritual element. We have the cultural um, values. We have the protocols. We have the pottery. Um, so all those key uh, spiritual cultural elements are missed from a Western um, perspective, but are embraced in the Kipu. So the Kipu models and knowledge production and knowledge sovereignty framework. The study locations, I had a great time, even though it was hard time sometimes coping with high altitude, but I had a great time working with uh, four Quechua communities in the highlands of Peru, Sakaka, Chawitari, Paru Paru, and Ilares, with Kachin in Choquecancha. Here are some pictures of my preliminary, um, sorry, sorry, my workshops. I conducted, so my research is working with four indigenous communities, so I had 
workshops before. I was conducting interviews that's during, and I'm still working with them. So this after, so it's before, during, and after. There are some more pictures there, um, and some elements of food sovereignty. That's when I decided to kind of change the title of my research. Once I went to the field, I realized that how Quechua people enact food security, how they exercise the right to food security, it's embedded in the self-determination and the way how they select their seats and the way how they, as a community, work together to make sure that it is enough food for everyone. So over there, you will see some corn, some beautiful corn that's been just grown by the communities. We were, we were talking about the variety of corn, the, the uses of the corn. Um, and the, also, you will see some pictures of the guinea pigs there, which is a sacred animal. Um, so I was there with them working with guinea pigs all over me, but I had the great time there. Here, we're having different nice food. Um, and again, something I should emphasize, indigenous people share the same worldviews, but they also have unique traditional ecological knowledge systems. Yachai and Quechua, um, the knowledge systems of the Quechua people and Mataranga in, in New Zealand, in Aotearoa. Here in Aotearoa, I, it was, it was a blessing to conduct research here. I was based in the North Island and it was very strategic. I chose the best months. I chose to conduct research from December till September. So I was up north, um, meeting with elders, come out to us. And I did my research with Nati Hine, Nati Puro, Nati Tufaretoa, and Nati Rarawa. Here we're just conducting some preliminary workshops talking circles, and also um, everything was a participatory action research, community-based project. Oh. Here's some more pictures. I'm there with um, an amazing Kiri Carr from Atipuroa. It's just amazing to talk to her and other Kamatwas. So the results of my study, yeah, because I only have 20 minutes to, to talk about this amazing and field work that I had in this research. This is the results of my study, a Ketri Maori food sovereignty security model. For Ketri Maori people, they can't conceive the idea of achieving food security without food sovereignty, without self-determination, without autonomy, to have control of the seeds, have control of what they produce, have control of what are going to make, what sort of food I want to make accessible. And again, at the core is land, Papa Tonuku in Maori, uh, for Maori people in um, Pachamama in the, in the highlands. We have culture, cultural values and norms, Maturanga Maori, traditional knowledge and practices, uh, Yachai, Self-determination also plays a key role. So that's the, in a nutshell, that's the food security, food sovereignty framework. And I'll expand a little bit more on it. So at the end, I realized that my research is more about food security through an indigenous lens, it's food sovereignty. Here I have a picture of the seed, seed is life. Um, in the highlands of Peru, there is still, con um, producing food, adopting their traditional food practices, conducting ceremonies as the, as the Maori of the food, the life essence, the spirituality is so enacted in the way how they produce food. Um, here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, I, the, similarly, the way how um, I conducted research with subsistent farms, which are not many, but I was very happy to see that renaissance of urban, of Maracay gardens. And here we can see San Kamatu was working um, with the, on the Najimaray, talking about the um, Maramataka calendar, and same in, in the highlands of Peru. They still produce food, adopting the Inca calendar, the 12 seasons. And in a Western society, we talk about the Inca calendar, but in fact, it is the Inti sun 
And it's also the Kiya, the moon. So it's the sun and moon, they brought together ever since duality. The Kiya represents the 12 festivals, and each festival represents a specific harvesting season. And so there's the Inca calendar here, the Maramataka, the same. It's the lunar calendar, and informs and guides farmers and growers and Maori people about the, the best times to go and harvest food. Also, another key finding is that embedded in the Maori worldviews and embedded in the Quechua cosmovisions are four, as Jessica in the morning said, we can talk about different elements, but in this case, I chose about four main key elements, cultural values that resonates greatly in the way how Maori and Quechua people um, governs and safeguards food security. Uh, here we have reciprocity, Koha, tikanga values, so important. You know, when you conduct ceremonies and harvest your food. Kaitakitanga, guardianship of the land. Um, Wairu, of course, of spirituality, similarly in the highlands of Peru. Ainu reciprocity, Ayo community, self governance, to know what to produce, and the dancers, the festivals, the, the food. Uh, Yanantin duality, again, the calendar, the Kiya and Inti calendar. Chaninche solidarity, humanity. These principles, these principles emphasize cultural identity, revitalization of indigenous food systems that value community participation, self-sufficiency, and empowerment, and thereby well-being. So in my view, and I argue that this is a framework, a tool that enacts food sovereignty. Although there is an absence of the use of indigenous food sovereignty, it has enacted in the way how the Quechua and the Maori people produce their food. And I feel this framework resonates greatly with the Hua Parikwari framework, and I feel that there doesn't need to be so many frameworks because the values that they are enacted. We just need to work together collaboratively to make sure that our voices are heard and how we regain and revitalize our food systems to be able to lead a good life, Maori order. And also I would like to end this presentation with um, in honoring for me, he was an amazing person. I've been working with him for the past few years, and I said I have been working and forever I'll be working because I know that for a Maori, lovely, humble guy to embrace me, he would call me an indigenous sister, and he would tell me stories about the Kumara and the Peru Peru potato and all the relationships that we had um, between Aotearoa and, and Peru. Um, really supported me and I would say his teachings will forever be there for me, um, for me in my studies. And I, my dissertation, my dissertation, I honored his voices. And one of the things that he left, um, I would say as a legacy, is food is medicine. And because he said, because how you grow your food affects the end product. And so you harvest traditional kai food. Then it harness your well-being and guari, and guairoa, spirituality, because you are nourishing your body with nutritious food. Food is medicine, and medicine is food. And it was probably one of the last interviews I, I had with, no interviews, corredos I had with, so with that, I would like to say, Sulpaki, thank you, Kiora, um, and I welcome any questions. <laughs>